Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 17th, and there are just 31 days until the first day of spring. We're down to the month mark, which is fantastic. Today we celebrate one of the earliest botanists and his essential discoveries about plant physiology. We'll also learn about a man known as the Prince of Alpine Gardeners. We'll hear the story of a woman who over-nurtures her houseplants. And we grow that garden library today with a book about worms from one of the best garden writers alive today. And then we'll wrap things up with the fascinating birth flowers for the month of February. But first, I just have a few tidbits for you today. If you are a master gardener and you're looking for continuing education credits, did you know that listening to garden podcasts often counts as continuing education. It's true. So if you are a podcast listener and a master gardener, you can really benefit from logging the hours that you're spending listening to podcasts. I will give you one word of caution though. Not every master gardener program is alike. They each have their own different quirks and bureaucracies, and they may or may not allow garden podcasts to count as continuing education credits. So before you get too excited, make sure that you check with whoever's administering your program and get it approved first. But in the event that it does qualify, well, you are in luck because in no time, you'll have your continuing education credits accounted for just by listening to gardening podcasts, which is tremendous. And then next, I wanted to mention that if you've signed up for the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter and you haven't gotten one yet, make sure to check in all your different inboxes, whether it's your spam or your promotions inbox, if you have a Gmail account, because sometimes those emails can end up there. So if you find them in there, make sure you drag them into your inbox so that your email provider knows that you want to see those emails. Now, if you haven't yet subscribed to the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter, it is so easy to do that. All you need to do is head on over to thedailygardener.org and right there on the homepage, you'll see a little box. It's got roses on it. And right there, you can subscribe to the newsletter. It's so easy. And while you're there, you can check out all of the show notes for every single episode, along with all of the book recommendations, botanical history, and poetry that's been shared on the show. It's all available for you there, and it's 100% free. So enjoy. Here's today's curated news. Today's curated news comes from the website Fizz.org. And this is a post that was written by Eric Lopestri. And I love the title. It says, Stickiness is a weapon some plants use to fend off hungry insects. In this article, Eric gives as an example of sticky plants petunias, and tobacco. And you're probably thinking of a few others as well as you're thinking about plants with their various textures. But Eric points out that this is an evolutionary defense mechanism. Insects that have to choose between a plant that's not sticky to eat or a plant that is sticky, they will always choose the plant that is not sticky. And so that aspect of the plant is a natural defense mechanism. Eric goes on to talk about sand and stickiness, as well as how sand can break down the mouth parts of insects, which is clearly not desirable. So if you're looking for an in-depth read on plant texture, stickiness, and insects, this is the perfect post for you. All you need to do is search for the word stickiness in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop right up.
Now, if you're not in the Facebook group, it is so easy to join. Don't sweat it. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook, just go on up to the search bar and type in Daily Gardener Community and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here are today's brevities for February 17th. Today is the anniversary of the death of Rudolf Jacob Camerarius, the botanist who demonstrated the existence of sexes in plants. He died on this day, February 17th in 1721. Rudolf was born in Germany, and he was a professor of natural philosophy. Rudolf identified and defined the flower's male parts as the anther, and he did the same thing for the female part, the pistil. And Rudolf figured out that it was pollen that made production possible. Rudolf's work was recorded for the ages in a letter that he wrote to a peer in 1694, and it was called On the Sex of Plants. And today is the birthday of the legendary rock and alpine gardener, plant explorer, nurseryman, writer, and painter, Reginald Farrer, who was born on this day, February 17th in 1880. A son of the Yorkshire Dales, Reginald was raised in upper middle class circumstances on the Farrer family estate called Ingleboro Hall in Clapham. And although Reginald was a world traveler, his heart belonged to Yorkshire, and he repeatedly referenced Yorkshire in his writing. Given Reginald's influence on rock gardening, I always find it rather fitting that Reginald's Ingleton home place was itself a large natural rock garden. Reginald was born with many physical challenges. He had a cleft palate, speech difficulties, and what Reginald called a pygmy body. Growing up, Reginald endured many surgeries to correct his mouth, which resulted in him being homeschooled. The silver lining to his solitary childhood was that Reginald learned to find happiness looking at the flora and fauna as he scoured the rocks, ravines, and hills around Ingleboro. By the time Reginald was 14 years old, he had created his first rock garden in an old kitchen garden at his family home. This little magical space would eventually transform into a nursery that Reginald called Craven, and it naturally specialized in Asian mountain plants. And every time Reginald went on an expedition, he would send back new alpine plants and seeds to Craven. When it was time, Reginald attended St. John's College at the University of Oxford. And it brings a smile to know that before he graduated in 1902, Reginald had left the school with his signature gift, a rock garden. Once he finished school, Reginald began botanizing in high places from the Alps to Ceylon and China. His first trip was to Tokyo, and he found a little house to rent that had, of course, a real Japanese rock garden. This living and botanizing experience in Japan became the basis for Reginald's first book called The Garden of Asia. During his 20s, Reginald liked to say that he found joy in high places, and the European Alps became a yearly touchstone. And although he saw some of the most incredible mountains in the world, they held no sway with Reginald. For Reginald, it was always about the plants. Reginald wrote, It may come as a shock and a heresy to my fellow ramblers when I make the confession that, to me, the mountains exist simply as homes and backgrounds to their population of infinitesimal plants. My enthusiasm halts 
with my feet at the precise point where the climber's energies are first called upon. Reginald's book, The Garden of Asia, launched his writing career, and Reginald's writing changed the way garden writers wrote about plants. The botanist Clarence Elliott observed, as a writer of garden books, Reginald stood alone. He wrote from a peculiar angle of his own, giving queer human attributes to his plants, which somehow exactly described them. As an example, here's a journal entry from Reginald from June 2nd, 1919. I sat down to paint it, the most marvelous and impressive rhododendron I'd ever seen, a gigantic, excellent with corrugated leaves and great white trumpets stained with yellow inside, a thing alone by itself, well worth all the journey up here. And oddly enough, I did not enjoy doing so at first. A first false start, a second better, splashed and spoilt than a mizzle, so that umbrella had to be screamed for and held up with one hand while I worked with the other. Then flies and torment, and finally a wild dust storm with rain and thunder came raging over so that everything had feverishly to be hauled indoors and the rhododendron fell over. But one moral is, only paint when fresh or before the day's toils. The rhododendron gave me such a bad night. I satisfactorily finished it, though it took till after 12. Many people have tried to puzzle out the personality of Reginald. While it's unanimously agreed that he could be eccentric, I'm not a fan of his harsher critics. I say, to discover Reginald's heart, learn how much he loved Jane Austen. In fact, his 1917 essay on Jane was judged to be, quote, the best single introduction to her fiction. And when he traveled, Reginald always brought her books along. Reginald once wrote that when traveling, he really only needed his clothing and Jane's books. And if he had to choose between the two, he'd keep the books. And there's a well-told story about Reginald that speaks to his ingenuity and uniqueness. Reginald was always searching for alpine plants that would grow in the British climate. One time, after an inspiring visit to Salon, Reginald got the idea to create a cliff garden with seeds from his trip. So when he returned home, he rowed a boat to the middle of the lake at Ingleboro, and he used a shotgun to blast the seeds into the face of the cliff. You can imagine his delight when his idea worked and the cliff was alive with plants. Today, although the cliff garden is no longer, there are many Himalayan plants like bamboo and rhododendron that remain around his home place, still thriving among the rocks in Ingleboro. In addition to having an impact on the field of garden writing, Reginald helped to change the course of British gardening. Reginald's influence happened to be timed perfectly as millions of eager British gardeners wrenched the hobby of gardening away from the elite. By this time, Reginald had earned the moniker the Prince of Alpine Gardeners. Reginald had mastered rock gardens. The trick was to make them look as natural as possible. And Reginald's passion for rock gardens came through in his famous 1907 book, My Rock Garden. Reginald's book and exploits made rock gardens trendy, and suddenly everyone wanted a rockery in their backyard. 
The rock garden craze made it all seem so simple, but Reginald knew full well the lengths he had to go to in order to source new alpine plants. During his two years in China, Reginald wrote, You're on an uncharted mountainside, and you have to, first of all, find the plant in the summer on the way up the mountain. Then in the autumn, you have to find the same plant, if it hasn't been eaten or trodden on, hope it's set seed and that the seeds haven't fallen yet. And this is just the start. After China, Reginald pivoted and became a war journalist during World War I, even embedding for a time along the Western Front. And of course, it was botany that helped Reginald carry out his work. While he wrote stories along the Italian front lines, he collected plants, once while taking fire from Austrian troops. Reginald knew this was insane, and he later wrote, What Englishman ever before has collected cyclamen on Monte Santo among the shellfire? After the war, in 1919, Reginald took a trip to the mountains of Myanmar in Upper Burma. He would never see his beloved Yorkshire again. He was just 40 years old. Somehow, Reginald met his end alone on a remote Burmese mountain, and his body was buried in Kung Lu in Burma. Most reports say he died of diphtheria, but the explorer and botanist Joseph Rock said he was told Reginald, who had become a devout Buddhist after college, had drank himself to death on the night of October 17th in 1920. And I thought of Reginald upon that mountain alone when I researched the etymology of the name of his nursery, Craven, which means defeated, crushed, or overwhelmed. Today, Reginald is remembered in the names of many plants, like the beautiful blue Gentiana farari and the Alpine Garden Society's most highly prized show medal, is the Far Medal, which honors the best plant in the show. In Unearthed Words, today's words are from The Complete Guide to Growing Windowsill Plants by Angela Williams Dewey and Donna Murphy. This is from their section called What is Your Gardening Style? And it's about the over-nurturer. When I first began growing houseplants, my mother sent me a cactus garden of native plants from her home in Phoenix, Arizona. My gardening style, I nurture plants to death. I check them daily, pluck off alien leaves, and water them every time I notice dryness. Now, my mother told me to watch the news and only water my cacti when it rained in Phoenix. I could not help primping my plants. They died within weeks by turning into a brown, mushy mess. My gardening style is an overly involved one, and once I chose plants that craved that kind of style— they flourished more than anything else I grew. Some of my most successful and needy plants have been an umbrella plant, an African violet, and a Tradescantia pallida. I also find that my kitchen windowsill herb garden thrives when I constantly rotate the plants in the sun and prune them for dinner recipes. So there you go, a few tips from an over-nurturer, which just might resonate with you. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Earth Moved by Amy Stewart. This book came out in 2012, and the subtitle is On the Remarkable Achievements of Earthworms. In this book, Amy introduces us to earthworms, and it turns out there's a ton to learn. 
Amy's book helps us understand more about these blind creatures and the vital work that they do on our planet, from moving soil and suppressing pests to cleaning up pollution, earthworms regenerate the soil. If you've ever wanted to know more about worms, then you're in good company. Charles Darwin was endlessly intrigued by earthworms, too. This book is 256 pages of life underground with the magnificent earthworm and Amy Stewart as your enlightening and entertaining guide. You can get a copy of The Earth Moved by Amy Stewart and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3. What a deal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Even though roses are often associated with February, thanks to Valentine's Day, February's birth flower is not the rose. Instead, February has two birth flowers. In England, February's birth flower is the violet, and in the United States, February is honored with the primrose. Concerning the violet, the plantsman Derek Jarman once wrote, Violet has the shortest wavelength of the spectrum. Behind it, the invisible ultraviolet. Roses are red, violets are blue. Poor violet, violated for a rhyme. The adorable little violet signifies many virtues, truth and loyalty, watchfulness, and faithfulness. If you give someone a violet, you're letting them know that you'll always be true. Like the theme song from Friends Promises, you'll always be there for them. The ancient Greeks placed a high value on the violet. When it came time to pick a blossom as a symbol for Athens, the violet made the cut. The Greeks used violet to make medicine, and they also used violets in the kitchen to make wine and to eat the edible blossoms. Today, violets are used to decorate salads, and they can even be sprinkled over fish or poultry. Violets are beautiful when candied in sugar or used to decorate pastries. Violets can even be distilled into a syrup for a violet liqueur. And finally, violets were Napoleon Bonaparte's signature flower. When his wife Josephine died in 1814, Napoleon covered her grave with violets. His friends even referred to Napoleon as Corporal Violet. And after he was exiled to Elba, Napoleon vowed to return before the violet season. Napoleon's followers used the violet to weed out his detractors. They would ask strangers if they liked violets. A positive response was a sign of loyalty. The other official February flower is the primrose, which originated from the Latin word primus, meaning first or early. The name is in reference to the fact that the primrose is one of the first plants that bloom in the spring. As with the violet, the leaves and flowers of primrose are edible, and they're often tossed into a salad. And in case you're wondering, the leaves are said to taste like lettuce. Now, gifting a primrose has a more urgent, stalkerish meaning than the violet, a primrose tells a person that you can't live without them. In Germany, people believed that the first girl to find a primrose on Easter would marry that same year. Talk about pressure. And then the saying about leading someone down the primrose path refers to enticing someone to do something terrible by laying out irresistible traps. The phrase originated in William Shakespeare's Hamlet as Ophelia begs her brother. She says, Do not, as some ungracious pastors do, 
show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, while like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads. And the man known as the Daffodil King, Peter Barr, bred over two million daffodils at his home in Surrey, and he's credited with popularizing the daffodil. Yet when Peter retired, he went to Scotland and grew not daffodils, but primroses. Two years before he died, Peter Barr, the Daffodil King, mused, I wonder who will plant my grave with primroses. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the daily gardener dot o-r-g. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.